than monitoring patients remotely. And finally, uh, the rapidly changing reimbursement landscape from CMS, which of course is designed to help pay physicians to treat patients remotely. This masterclass is being sponsored by Flexion Therapeutics, the producer of an extended release cortical steroid named Zilretta, and is organized by MedTech Momentum, who is the premier life sciences marketing form firm and orthopedics this week. We are the largest circulation publication in orthopedics. And we have an outstanding faculty today. Uh, on our surgeon panel, our faculty members include Scott Sigmund, who is the team, team physician. Orth he's an orthopedic surgical at Orthopedic Surgical Associates, and he is the chief medical officer at Ortho Laser, Orthopedic Laser Centers. Also, Michael Axe, an orthopedic surgeon and partner with First State Orthopedics mm -hmm. and professor of physical therapy at the University of Delaware and John Barrington, orthopedic surgeon at the Joint Replacement Center in Texas. Our CEO panel is with John Brownlee. He's the chief executive officer of VidScript. It's a very in innovative technology for interacting with patients and keeping them on track with their treatments. Johnny Ross is with us. He's the chief executive officer of MedHab, which has some very cool technologies for measuring all kinds of patient metrics remotely. And finally, we cap off this, what I think is a very strong program with one of the leading reimbursement experts in the US from MICRA, which is the top regulatory and reimbursement consulting firm in the US, and that's Lauren Craig. I'm Robin Young, I'm the publisher of Orthopedics This Week, and I'll be today's moderator. Uh, each faculty member uh, is gonna give a five minute five or six minute overview of their subject matter. And then after all the talks are done, they'll answer your questions. So please, during the, uh, during the presentations, just go right ahead and, and put in your questions. We've got about 300 participants in our virtual classroom today. So one very important piece of administrative housekeeping that we should get out of the way, how to ask a question, Write your questions in the chat section of the Zoom app. So it's right at the bottom of the picture there and just wiggle your cursor, you'll see it. Be sure to indicate who, to whom you are directing your question. So I thank you all for joining us today and I am really looking forward to our, to our program. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce this terrific panel of physician. And first at bat is Scott Sigmund. So Scott, how are you working with your patients who have had their surgeries delayed and need your help? Scott? Great, Rob, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, the bottom line is, guys, uh, this is my first global pandemic. Uh, and as many emails as I've been checking, uh, I have not been able to get a playbook on how we're supposed to be treating our patients. So we're really flying by the seat of our pants here, trying to decide the safety of our, of our staff, the safety of our patients, but yet also provide effective treatment for our patients that are in knee pain. As everyone is aware, elective surgery has essentially been shut down. Uh, we have no idea when that's going to be uh, reopening at this point. So you know, for me, as I was uh, trying to decide what sort of treatment options that we have for our patients with osteoarthritis knee pain, I was like, okay, let's come up with a plan that's going to minimize the exposure to patient and staff. But then we also want to have some duration of action, right? I want a reproducible, reliable duration to hopefully allow the patient to get pain relief, be seen quickly for a 10 minute appointment for an injection, and then allow them to sort of hopefully stay out of the office for a period of time. So that's for, for the process of what's happening here during a pandemic. Now let's talk about post-pandemic as we emerge from this pandemic, how are we gonna treat our patients? We're gonna have a huge backlog. I mean, these elective surgeries, we, we were barely keeping up with elective surgery for most arthroplasty surgeons in, in the pre-pandemic era. So how are we gonna do this with all of these extra patients. So Vin Das is a close friend of mine, vice chairman of the LSU Department of Orthopedics. He's predicting it may take two to three years for us to be able to manage this backlog of elective arthroplasty patients. So what are we gonna do? Well, we gotta provide them pain relief 
and providing uh, someone with pain relief with a reliable, predictable uh, three month course of, of action or duration of action, according to the FDA pivotal study, uh, upwards of 70% of patients get pain relief out to three months. That's pretty good. So, so really Zoretta falls into a really good option uh, for treatment for me as well. So I am also a national leader in opioid sparing strategies. It's one of my great passions. One of the things that I'm most worried about with teleconferencing and this backlog of patients, our doctor is going to get a little lazy here and start prescribing opioids for these chronic conditions. And I want to emphasize, so important, the last thing you want to do is take an opioid naive patient with a chronic problem and provide them opioids because now you've made them opioid addictive and now they have two problems. So one of the, a couple of things that have sort of come up as, in the discussion as we've been talking about our plans within our office for treatment, one of the concerns that I hear routinely is, are we setting up our patients for a, a decreased immune response by doing a corticosteroid to the knee in the setting of this pandemic? And the CDC has opined on that. Uh, and they have uh, basically stated at this point that they have, there's no evidence uh, for decreased immunity in the setting of, of this COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Uh, so we're following along the CDC guidelines. And when patients are in pain requiring issue, I think an intraarticular inject, uh, injection of corticosteroid is very reasonable. And then providing them three months of relief, uh, Zoretta is my go-to to try and keep them out on, in their office, uh, I'm sorry, out of the office for as long as possible. One of the other things I'm going to finish up with this is that we hear routinely about when can you do a knee replacement after an intraarticular injection of cortisone. And, and if you poll uh, surgeons across the country, it's anywhere from three months to six months, but most people sort of fall into the three month category. And, and the thought process is the reason that you have a slight increased risk of infection after an intraarticular injection of cortisone is that you inoculate the joint with maybe one or two bacterium that just sort of sit there. Uh, and then they're waiting for action, you do surgery, and then uh, infection happens. So to, to be clear, there are no studies on Zilretta uh, at what timeline would be safe or not safe in the setting of a total knee replacement. But we do have studies which clearly demonstrate that Zilretta, which is triamcinolone acetonide, is out of the joint within three months. And we also have discrete evidence that shows that the microspheres, which is the delivering agent for this, is out of the knee within four months. So it might be interesting that the panel might be able to jump in and describe what their thoughts are. I'm sure we'll get some questions as well, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Scott. That was, that was really terrific. Uh, before we start with our next speaker, uh, I think we may have uh, a poll that we can uh, share with our audience. Uh, Carolina? That polls from my talk, uh, about two from now. Okay, and, and the results from the polls, by the way, everybody will be available at the end of all the talks. So it should be a very interesting. We'll have a number of other polls. Uh, yeah, and here's the second one. Very good. Thank you, Carolina. So, great. So now uh, our next speaker is John Barrington, who works at the Joint Replacement Center of Texas. John, uh, What's been your experience in Texas and how are you tackling this issue of patient treatment in the age of COVID-19? Morning, Robin, and thank you. I'd like to say hi to all the faculty and the participants, the attendees, and good morning to everyone. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, with you all here. I can, got a few slides. Can you see that? Not yet, John. Okay. Well, I want to organize my thoughts here. What, what uh, to answer your question, Robin, when we look at orthopedic care in a time of crisis, uh, for me, it really focuses on what does the world need from us right now? And, and I sort of group that into four C's, if you can remember uh, four points. One is connection with our colleagues. Number two, I'd say is connection with our patients. And then the other two are more humanitarian. Number three, I'd say, is the way that we connect with our loved ones at a time like this. And number four is our, our development of our character or our social interaction. 
So I'm going to see if uh, if there's a way here via Zoom that I can share my screen. I'm going to try that one more time. And Carolina, if you can help do that, we can share some slides with the folks. So is that green button, is that working below your screen? Yeah. OK. I, I, I don't think we're seeing it yet, John. Sorry. OK. It's not allowing me to share, but that's OK. So um, number one, connection with our colleagues. You know, it's the people that we work with that we love so much, uh, whether it's our, our colleagues in the operating room, our reps, our PAs, our other physician colleagues that we see in the office. And that looks different at this time. So uh, connection in this time is it's the same principle. It's just remote. So you've jumped onto this master class treatment strategies uh, for patients with delayed arthroplasty. That's one way to connect with your colleagues. Um, the Academy has a sponsored orthopedic response on COVID-19 that's uh, going on the next two days. And I'll be jumping on over there when this conference is done. Um, Take the chance to reach out to your PAs, to your reps, to the people who are upstream or downstream from your work line and let them know that you care about them and that you, you want to know that they're doing okay and that you're not going away, that you're here for them both before and after this epidemic. Number two is connection with our patients. And this is what we all truly love is patient care, right? And that's what stings a little bit during this time is that as orthopedic surgeons, we maybe feel like our usefulness isn't uh, being put to best use the way it is that when we're not in a time of epidemic. It's what we truly love. That connection doesn't necessarily need to go away, but by, by necessity, much of it becomes remote. And my encouragement is we just need to adapt. So uh, I had never done a telehealth visit before last week, and we're up and running. We're seeing patients every day via telehealth. I'm also offering patients injections. So I'm going into the office one day a week, and we're doing a lot of injection. Um, obviously, the, uh, the risk factors for your patients depend on their age and the prevalence of COVID-19 in your area, so use your sense of judgment. But for me, one day a week in the office offering injection to patients who uh, otherwise would be suffering is a great, great way to bridge the gap. In terms of what we're using, uh, we know from good phase three pivotal trial uh, published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2018 by Conahan and Associates, that using an extended release triamcinolone provides excellent pain relief. Um, and our exploratory endpoints of WOMAC and Coos subscale show that the relief we get at four months is about equivalent uh, with extended release triamcinolone to what we get with crystalline suspension or short acting triamcinolone at one month. So uh, this is something to consider when we think about how can we bridge the gap for patients over a time frame that may be longer than just one to two months. And that's what I'm doing a lot of in the office on uh, the one day a week that I'm in the office. In terms of number three, I would say the most important thing I'm doing, Robin, is trying to make a connection uh, with the people in my life that are outside my orthopedic world. So uh, the day before yesterday was a, a 70 degree sunny afternoon here in Texas. And I, I can't remember the last time I uh, went fishing on a Tuesday afternoon with my high school son, but that's exactly what we did. And um, whether it's call your parent, call your child, uh, write a, an email note or a text uh, to a friend or a loved one, I think that one of the things that we can do during a time like this is reconnect or re-engage in a way that we haven't previously. And then number four, I think the way that we stand tall in a time like this is via character. Um, each of you that are on this call have an exceptional ability to learn. Uh, you have the capacity and the time material on the pandemic that we're going through right now. You have the ability to coalesce and summarize information. And then finally, each of you has a circle of influence that needs your thoughtfulness and your stability right now. And that combination of uh, coalescing of information and thoughtfulness and uh, a physical and emotional stability can be a tremendous benefit to the people around you. So in summary, I'd say as orthopedists right now, what the world needs from us are, are really four C's. Connection with our colleagues, we need to stay sharp. Connection with our patients, be a source of help for them. 
connect with your loved ones, re-engage in places that you may not have been engaged recently. And, and in terms of character, be a source of hope and stability for those around you. And that's really the summary of my thoughts, Robin. I'll send it back to the panel. <laughs> John, uh, that was really, really good. I, uh, I think all of us, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, we, uh, we entirely agree with you. And I think in times like this, we, we go into the crisis. We communicate twice as much as we used to. So those, John, you, 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 you are exactly right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. X, and I, I know you employ several strategies, including I think a radio talk show. And, I, and you deal like the vast majority of orthopedic and sports medicine physicians do with all kinds of patients, diabetic patients, obese, and so forth. Uh, how have you approached the challenges of these times? Well, I have a couple things. Uh, the first is I'm the chair for sports safety here in the state, and we canned all our schedule. So last night, one of my radio guys said, well, what are you doing? What do you think? Well, I'm happy to hear that the NCAA has extended their seasons for those kids that are playing uh, that didn't get a chance to play. But they put me on the bench because I'm over 65. My partner says the young guys are going to take this on. So they said, do something else with your time. So that's what I'm doing. So there's some things we're going to learn from this from this orthopedics. We're going to respond to these situations. And what we want to do is minimize the people going to the emergency room. The most at risk probably patient is the diabetic patient who has seven over 10 knee pain, hasn't slept for two days. What are you going to do? And you certainly don't want them in the emergency room. And what we've done is we bring them into the office and we want to give them a long acting you know, triamcinolone, extended release, that it's going to help them. Uh, and we're hoping that they're not going to have uh, a reaction uh, to the steroid that's going to prompt them to have to call their family medicine die or go to the emergency room for a high blood sugar. And we've had a lot of success. And if you look at the literature, uh, certainly we've been fortunate uh, that there's some studies that show that the, that the uh, Zaretta hasn't had the problems that other, other uh, short acting steroids have had. But in our, we've looked at our, we have 66 in our practice, of which We've given bilateral Zaretta injections at the same time with A1Cs of between six and 12. And we have not noticed a very large increase. In fact, it's been less than, than 40, uh, which has been really good. And it res responded with back within two days, no need to go to the emergency room or to see their family doc and no repeat office exposure. They don't have to come back for 12 weeks. So that's certainly one. And I think that that first uh, question that we put up there, we've already answered uh, which was, uh, if you would put that up for me on the glucose question. Marlena. Okay. Well, if we can't go up there. It'll, it'll be up in a second. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, so the other thing, Rob, is if they went to the emergency room expecting a shot for that seven over 10 pain that didn't sleep for, at least in Delaware, they're not going to get a shot. Our docs are, don't stock the drugs and aren't willing to really give it. So they're going to end up having the pain anyway. So you should keep your office uh, open if you can. And we'll discuss that with my third topic. So let's just move on to the, so the answer to that one uh, is uh, true. Okay. okay, and we can move on to the next question here. Okay. So could I have my next question, please? This is the second candidate. You know, delay in surgery isn't new. Uh, those of us that have patients that are biggins that are over that 49 uh, BMI, they can't have surgery or shouldn't have surgery because their incidence of problems goes way up uh, in the complications. So we've been practicing this technique of delaying surgery for a while. So we probably should draw from those things that we've been doing and I don't know if the question will come up, if it comes up, but if you have a BMI of 49, the likelihood of you being under 45, which is what we're searching for, at least the minimum of 45 is gonna be 1% per month or four months. Well, gosh, put four months of Zaretta's action together with the four months that you need to delay surgery anyway. Use those techniques that we've had in the past. And I'm gonna to offer to you that, listen, you need to, to do that, and it, it will really allow you to move forward 
uh, with a, a very reliable state. And you'll feel like you can do that. And uh, being a physical therapy professor, we tend to, to like a prehab program. It gives you time to get strong. So while you're waiting to have your surgery, I encourage you to get on your exercise program and use these three to four months that your surgery was delayed to do something productive. So that's my, that's my rehab uh, uh, spot. The, uh, the, sec the last one is, how do we keep our office open? Boy, I always felt really relieved when JBJS came out with the Singapore experience and the CDC. And our office has been able to really move forward with a program that uh, we chose our largest office. It has three, six patient room uh, availabilities. We rotate our staff. We wear masks and gloves. We schedule our people uh, uh, a little lighter so that no one is sitting in the waiting room. We have the waiting room marked off so that you have uh, six feet between you and the next chair, uh, which is what we wanted to do. But what we've really done is we have the people wait in the car and we call them in when it's their turn for their appointment. They can bring one loved one in and that has really been helpful. Now, after this is all done, we have, uh, we have the first responders prioritized program that we began in our office, which is basically those people that are first responders, policemen, firemen, healthcare workers, those essential workers that we see uh, as demarcated by the government, that these are essential, uh, we have them at the top of the list, ready to go. Why? Because they got to heal and recover. And these are the guys that are going to be backing up. They're the reserves to the people that are working currently. So we would offer to others, consider those people, put them at the top of your list and operate whenever you can to get them ready because that is the second team that needs to be the first team. That's all I got. <laughs> that was great. No, that was, that was just really, really excellent. Uh, we are, we, we have a, uh, I've never heard the term before, Zoom bombing, but apparently we have so many people <laughs> In our in our room in our room that it is limiting the features of Zoom right now and and we will be putting up uh, some additional poll questions for everyone to participate in as as things I guess uh, free up. Interestingly enough, our attendance is growing as we move along here. This is uh, this is turning into a, a terrific panel and a terrific masterclass. So uh, we will have questions for our our physicians at the end of this, and we're gonna have results from some of the polls at the end of it. Uh, right now we're moving into our CEO panel. And again, you're hearing some strategies, you're hearing about how they're using injections, how they're staying in touch with their patients. There's a couple companies that have come up with what I think are pretty interesting novel approaches to help physicians do exactly that. So our first chief executive officer and company uh, is uh, John Brownlee with Vidscript, and I'm very excited about your company, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. John, you're up. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. Um, I have these absolutely gorgeous slides that you have to see to believe <laughs> that are so amazing, and you're not going to get to see them because somebody once might want to Zoom bomb us, which is a new pandemic-only term, apparently. So that's okay, we'll go old school. So uh, a little bit about Vidscript. Uh, started the company uh, about just over eight years ago um, <clears throat> with the premise that uh, um, uh, my mother lives in uh, Portland, Oregon and uh, I live in Minneapolis and uh, um, she has a number of chronic conditions and I never had the opportunity to really understand what her doctors were saying to her. Um, and as the person who's the furthest away trying to manage mom's conditions, that was became really difficult. I asked her one day to take her phone in to an exam room and record the doctor. And the doctor didn't want her to do that, which I completely understood. And uh, it got me thinking that we're all carrying around high definition video cameras in our pockets. And yet we know that uh, for those of you who are healthcare providers uh, on this, uh, you repeat yourselves all the time, every day, over and over again. You say the same things to patients over and over again, but Studies show that patients forget maybe up to 85% uh, of what they learn at the point of care. And the perishable nature of those encounters mean that they uh, patients call back and consume staff time 
Uh, patient satisfaction is lower when they just don't really feel like they understand what's going on. Uh, patients cancel appointments and, and, and procedures. Uh, they arrive for procedures, they're not prepared, and all of these things that everybody who's a, a provider on the, on the call um, certainly understands. So what we did eight years ago is begin to think about how we could create simple video recordings uh, of healthcare providers and then allow them to share those recordings directly with their patients uh, and do that in a way that's highly scalable. And uh, it's, it, we certainly didn't have we just certainly didn't have it figured out in the first few years, but um, but we've gotten pretty good at it now. And so our platform is called VidScript. I'm going to show you. Hopefully you can see. Yeah, yeah. That is a VidScript. Yeah. This is Dr. Greg Barton. He's an orthopedic surgeon in Miami, and what he's done is he sat in front of his laptop, and we have a virtual recording studio that interviews him and asks him a whole bunch of questions. In this case, he's, uh, he's created a series of vid scripts about total knee replacement. So it's everything from it's a week before surgery to the night before surgery to the day after, 90 days after, and so forth. He answers all those questions just sitting in front of his laptop. We take over the camera, we record his answers, and then we stitch together those little videos into what we call vid scripts, which are video prescriptions. And then those video prescriptions can be delivered to a patient by a text message at just the right time in a care episode. So the night before surgery, for those of you who maybe call your patients the night before surgery, um, if you can think about what it would be like to call a patient who had just had all of their questions answered about their surgery by you, by video, and you think about what the change, what the different nature of that conversation uh, might be. Uh, so we've been doing this for eight years or so. We've got some really great data that shows us this can impact some outcomes that people care about. Um, one, one slide that I was going to show you is uh, um, uh, surgery cancellation rates. So um, in urology, we, we do a lot of work in urology, and uh, there's a number of the elective procedures in urology that have very high cancellation rates for a number of reasons. Um, in one case, 37% cancellation rate that we were able to reduce to 11%. So that's a 70% relative risk, risk reduction or relative reduction in cancellations, um, just simply as a result of the patient receiving by a text message their own doctor um, at, at leading up to um, leading up to that procedure. So in the best of times, VidScript is used to help patients navigate a surgical procedure or be discharged after a procedure or a new diagnosis or any number of things. But in pandemic, in particular, we have a situation where your capacity is, is declining because your staff is laid off and furloughed, yet the information requirements from patients is probably increasing. And I think when you're all back to work and everybody's trying to figure out how they're going to slot their procedures back in, I think that that uh, that, that dynamic is going to, you're trying to re-onboard your, your employees and engage with your patients. I think the, the, the need to, in a highly scalable yet also personal way, to communicate the right information is going to be really acute. Um, so what I would uh, suggest to you, if you're interested in this, uh, we have a, uh, 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 we've partnered with AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals to develop a COVID specific mm -hmm. education program on the VidScript platform. It's going to launch tomorrow. And if I could show you my slide, I would, but all you need to do, if you want an invitation to that program is send us a text message and so you're going to have to write this down because you're not going to be able to see it. But our short code is 73771. 73771. That's the phone number you send it to. And just in the message, just write COVID-19. doesn't have to be case sensitive or anything. Just write COVID-19 in the message. Send that to 73771. You'll get a little confirmation back that says, thank you. You're on the waiting list. And as soon as the, um, there we go. As soon as the um, program launches, and we're very grateful to AstraZeneca for their sponsorship of this program, they've been amazing. Um, as soon as that program launches, you'll receive an invitation, you'll go to a landing page, fill out a little uh, form to register, and then you can come into our virtual recording studio, answer all the questions, um, and then uh, you can share those videos with your patients by embedding on your website, mm -hmm. sending them by text and email, and even sharing them on social media. Dr. Sigmund's done this. He's got some great VidScript content that he's made already. And we'd, uh, we'd love to work with you through the pandemic and even beyond. And the platform's completely free for you to use, of course. So there's, there's, no, there's no cost for it. So 
Um, so, Robin, that's my uh, that's my verbal only <clears throat> explanation hey, well, of what we do. I, I'm actually I kind of like the verbal only. No offense <laughs> yeah, to anybody with all the slides. I think I think in this particular medium, this works very well, and even the casual nature, it you're getting the real deal. And John, uh, I love what you're doing. Uh, I hope everybody adopts it. What a great tool to use to communicate with patients. It's just congratulations. Uh, so that was that was terrific. Everybody, check out his company. The next company uh, and chief executive officer is MedHab. It's Johnny Ross. Johnny, what kind of products do you offer to help physicians monitor their patients remotely, and what can they learn about their patients from using your products? Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you for putting this on. Uh, all of you for attending today. I wish you all uh, health in these troubling times. Uh, MedHab was uh, formed in uh, actually in 2008 when we started this journey of remote technology. It was really based on, on a knee injury that I had just from years and years of sports. Uh, but we have two technologies that are available for, for, for providers today for remote uh, physical therapy, quite frankly. One is step right. Uh, think of an insole, uh, just like a Dr. Scholl's that you would see in the store, uh, with the exception of all the technology that we have is resonant within the insole. And uh, the device allows a, a physical therapist or a doctor to remotely monitor patients by way of prescribing uh, rehabilitative protocols, which range from gait analysis, range of motion analysis, force distribution, uh, there is 140 different American Physical Therapy Association exercises that are embedded into the system. Uh, the technology is called Steprite, S-T-E-P-R-I-T-E. -E. And you can visit www.medhab, which is M-E-D-H-A-B.com for more information on it. But again, it's a pair of insoles. Uh, your physical therapist, for example, could prescribe a rehabilitative uh, therapy, whether it's TKA, some low back injury, any type of uh, lower extremity, extremity injury. You could set a rehabilitative protocol. You can customize it to meet the patient's needs. Uh, you're able to see via the dashboard report, reports their gait analysis, if they're heel to toe striking, if they're moving from supination to pronation. Everything is time stamped. Uh, our force distribution dashboard show symmetry or, or lack thereof, left to right, as well as within the quadrants of the foot. So again, you know, you know, based on what the patient's doing, if they are standing behind the ankle, you know, or on the ball of foot, if they're supinating or pronating, it even shows uh, line graphs, you know, the two limbs, hopefully as they uh, get better, you see these line graphs start to, to merge. Uh, the third dashboard that's available for managing your patient is a range of motion dashboard. Uh, you know, you may have something like a, we'll just say a, a knee extension exercise, right? Uh, it shows again, the, the degrees of motion day to day and over time. It shows compliance if the patient is able to do what you're asking them to do, which obviously is the most important thing when they're not in front of you. Uh, the technology can actually be used pre and post-operatively um, to manage your patients. And I think at a time right now, preoperative would be very apropos to, to use. For the patient, it's, it's simple. All the patient does is register the account uh, online on medhab.com. They download the app. And when you as the provider input the protocol and, and, and prescribe the device to the patient, uh, whatever you put in there, whether you want them to do their exercises twice daily, 10 repetitions, two second hold times, and any number of exercises, it's all there in the app. When they pair and connect, they just click the app and it turns on and they just follow the instructions. It's audible, it's textual, and there's even a 3D animated image that, uh, that goes through the, uh, the exercises in the exact order and in synchronization with what you want. So there's no flailing of the limbs. They're doing this very, very um, uh, to, to the degree that you want them to, to make these exercises, just like a virtual physical therapist would be there. In addition to the daily reports that could be used by either you or a physical therapist, we also uh, send 
weekly and monthly reports directly to the doctor for purposes of remote patient monitoring. Those are, those are compliance reports, gate reports, and uh, enforced distribution reports so that anybody within your office per remote you know, uh, patient monitoring can make phone calls and engage your patients to make sure that they're doing what they need to do and they're meeting the tolerance that you would like. I would like to offer as well that the technology, because of COVID-19, we have now just uh, embedded some uh, characteristics and we supply a pulse oximeter. So now the pulse oximeter with that, you can do your, the patient will enter at the beginning and at the end of their therapy, their heart rate and oxygen saturation, which may help you look at some pulmonary issues up to and including the potential for COVID-19. But important to that too is, you know, pulse oximetry, oximetry is one of the qualifiers for remote patient monitoring. So it's embedded in the system. So you are able to manage your patient, not just during the acute episode of physical therapy, but ongoingly throughout the year and earn uh, reasonable uh, reimbursements that will be discussed shortly. The sister product to StepRight is called My Notify, and it was a, a, initially designed as a fall detection device. And it can be worn on either wrist or either ankle. And we have engineered it with 40 different American Physical Therapy Association exercises, as well as what's called Otago exercises, which are strengthening exercises for mitigating falls up to 35%. It too is at driven, works very similarly to, uh, to my note, uh, to step right, excuse me. And it shows different range of motion exercises. It shows the speed of those exercises in milliseconds. It shows the repetitions and the degrees, all of which you or your, your physical therapist can manage that patient remotely to see everything that's going on. Again, for the patient, it's simple. They just click, click on the exercise and, and, they, and they, do, they perform it. Um, very simple to register. You could actually call for more information. We have technicians ready to answer any questions or support you at 800-541-1420. The process is simple. Uh, you would just uh, register the count or your physical therapy would register their count. Um, it goes with the NPI. We check with CMS to make sure that the provider is in good standing. Uh, it takes about 24 hours. And then from there, you're ready to navigate the system, prescribe uh, my notify to your patients and set the rehabilitative protocols for either step right or my notify. Again, that is 1-800-541-1420. You can also get more information by visiting www.medhab.com. So in close, you know, what it, what it offers is the 3D tracking, pressure sensing, quick time wireless communication. It's HIPAA secured, FCC regulated and, and um, certified. And the devices are class two and class one exempt devices respectively. So, uh, Barring any questions, I'll turn it back over to Robin at this time. Well, don't worry, Johnny. There'll be questions uh, coming your way. That was uh, that was terrific and, and truly uh, remote patient monitoring. This is just getting started. Uh, this is the future. And I will also offer that at some point, I don't know when it'll all happen, uh, we'll all be on 5G, which is a, 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 a giant leap forward in terms of connectivity. So all the things that you're doing, Johnny, and everyone else who's collecting data, this is clearly the future. It's never too early to start. I hope everyone uh, uh, does contact you and, and get going. Uh, so finally, uh, nothing happens without reimbursement. And that landscape has been shifting lately to help us understand what's going on and how we might, as physicians, benefit from that. We're really honored to have Lauren Craig with us from MICRA. Lauren, uh, please take it away. Will do. I am going to try to cast this slide, <laughs> even though Good we've luck. been Zoom bombed, um, because what is a reimbursement presentation without slides with a bunch of codes on it? Um, so let's see if, if this works. Um, and if it doesn't, I can absolutely talk through. Use your, yeah, paint with words. Yeah, exactly. So let's just see real quick. Uh, since I had such success yesterday. Oh, 
Are we casting? We're good. All We're right, good. great, great. So um, hopefully I won't put you to sleep with a, a bunch of discussion of the, hey, the various there's, codes. There's money involved. We're good. That's right. How, how do we get paid for everything um, and take great care of our patients as well? Um, so, you know, I really wanted to go over kind of what this world looks like, you know, post coronavirus. And I think it's, it's important to step back since we just heard from a couple of, um, you know, amazing CEOs with great digital health technology to think about where we were prior to this world. And one of the, the biggest difficulties in the uptake of digital health recently is this idea of how do we get patients to not, not only um, subscribe to this new idea of uh, sending prescriptions out um, via devices, but then getting them to use them, right? And so what this kind of pandemic presents as an opportunity for, um, for physicians is the kind of the forced utilization of this new technology by your patients. And that doesn't happen very often. So I think one thing to think about is how is this pandemic going to change the way that we are currently potentially, um, you know, prescribing prescriptions to our patients and, and what digital health technologies can we start to incorporate in our practice algorithms? So, you know, effective March 6th, Congress signed the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, which really gave the secretary the power to dismiss any telehealth restrictions that existed prior to coronavirus for Medicare beneficiaries. And it really intended for the law to create new pathways for seniors in particular to receive care so that they didn't have to go into acute care settings and potentially be exposed to the virus. Um, within this Appropriations Act, the 1135 waiver was also passed. And what this said primarily is that, and these slides will be sent out to everybody, but it really lifted restrictions on the use of telehealth services. So prior to this 1135 waiver, the patient had to have been an established patient. That's the primary um, you know, guideline. And then secondarily, they really could, these codes really could only be used for patients that were in rural settings. So that couldn't easily drive to a physician's office. And that meant that, um, and this, these are Medicare regulations, obviously not private, um, insurance regulations that really kind of, you know, decrease the utilization of these codes and the uptick of digital health technology in general. So with these passages, Medicare said they will not only pay for telehealth services to patients that aren't already established, that don't live in rural health areas, but they agreed that the payment would be at the same rate as an in-person visit for any diagnosis. So not just services related to COVID-19, but this is really a push so that physicians can manage any condition from anywhere at the same rate that they were getting prior to this COVID-19 pandemic, which, and if you think about it from a, you know, an overall perspective is a really great thing and really can push the utilization of digital health and remote patient monitoring devices forward. So, um, the, the other thing is physicians can reduce or waive cost sharing for telehealth visits. Now, there is this discussion about, you know, what does that mean for the anti-kickback statute that exists? And so the AMA is really working with CMS to look into that. Um, but physicians can provide telehealth services from their home. So prior again to this 1135 waiver or telehealth services, if, if you're as a physician wanted to provide that, you really had to be within the bounds of either the hospital you were working at or um, you know, your office. Uh, there also is, is flexibility if, as to what constitutes a device that can be used um, that is HIPAA compliant, right? So prior to the 1135 waiver, FaceTime and Skype weren't necessarily considered HIPAA compliant. Well, with this waiver, administration has said, you know, absolutely use FaceTime. It's, it's you know, one of the largest widely available tools at the moment. And so they've really provided some flexibility as to what constitutes a device and what is HIPAA compliant. I think we all know that, you know, 
the idea of, of HIPAA compliance within communicating with our patients through portals has been a little bit difficult sometimes from an uptick standpoint. So administration is looking at, you know, how can we make it easier for our patients to communicate with our physicians? The AMA has some great resources, so I encourage you to really go to their website and we will be sharing some of those as well. So, you know, we talked about the fact that the patient doesn't have to be an established patient any longer. Well, we've outlined some of the codes right here that, that can be used for telehealth and build for telehealth services. And those are the same codes that you've been using in the past. So I think we got a question earlier about what constitutes a level two, three, four visit. It's the same, um, you know, information or guidelines or documentation that you have to, to really um, document if the patient were in your office seeing you for that type of visit. So think about that when you're doing it and, and um, you know, discussing this with your patients. What is that medical decision making that you're, you're kind of discussing? And you can see here there are five codes for new visit, new patients, and then five codes for established patients. So the other thing uh, prior to, pre to, to the coronavirus is there were G codes established in 2019 and those will continue to be utilized going forward. Uh, and you can see that there's a big focus on inpatient telehealth follow-up and then also some telehealth uh, pharmaceutical management. So, you know, the discussion that we were having earlier is very relevant. And then there's also a remote evaluation of recorded video. So if your patient, you know, wants to show you exactly kind of what they're going through and they want to send it to you, um, you know, they're really trying to look at how can we capture as much data as possible during this time. So we talked a little bit about remote patient monitoring. And I think that the big thing to remember from remote patient monitoring and the big question out there is what constitutes a device that's able to be used for remote patient monitoring. And, and um, Johnny Ross kind of touched on this earlier, but there was another big change that really recently happened. And prior to 2019, physicians were the only ones who are allowed to bill for and practice remote patient monitoring. And in 2019, we saw a technical correction to the CPT code 99457, which allowed for incident two billing, which basically means that nurses and licensed care managers are actually now able to bill for and perform remote patient monitoring. And this was really under the guise of wanting to free up time for, you know, our physicians to be able to practice at the top of their license. So, um, you know, we've provided a link here that kind of discusses that, that change uh, more in depth, but that was a pretty significant change. What does that mean for your practice? It just means that more of these, as more of these devices really, um, you know, pop up and, um, and your patients are able to kind of use them to, to really track their conditions at home, you can actually have some of your nurses or, or some of your um, personnel that have downtime potentially, and you can really kind of engage with your patients in a different way than maybe you had before. So we've, um, We've included the codes here and their descriptors. And, and you can see here that, you know, there are a couple of examples of what constitutes remote patient monitoring. Obviously recording of weight, recording of blood pressure, pulse oximetry, respiratory flow rate. So it really has to do with something related back to either a vital or, or something that you would be documenting in the chart. Um, one thing I, I did want to clarify though, is that there were 23 codes that were released recently to help clarify the services that, um, that fall under remote patient monitoring. So even if maybe it's not included in the, the descriptor right here in the code descriptor, I would follow up with your specialty society or, or somebody that you work with within your hospital to really discuss what is, what is remote patient monitoring constituted under our definition. And with that, I will turn it back to Robin. Thank you very much. And let me get my screen back on there. Fantastic. Lauren, that was, uh, that was terrific. Okay, so before we get going on our questions, I wonder if we could show any of the poll results. And I wonder if we are still being Zoom bombed and if, that's, <laughs> if, that, is a, if that is doable. So while we're waiting for that, uh, 
Yes, and thank you, Lauren. Actually, you did speak to this, but I'm going to put up the question anyway. Uh, and uh, it comes from uh, uh, one of our panelists, or excuse me, one of our audience members. Uh, and I think you did, but can you speak to the reimbursement expectations for telehealth visits? I think you laid that out quite nicely. Uh, have you had any visibility to the expected billing rates for each visit and the types of patient interactions that qualify uh, as a two, three, or four? Oh, I'm sorry, here we have some poll results. Because of COVID-19 concerns, I am treating most of my patients from home. About half of you are, about a fourth of you are in my clinic, and about a fourth are other. Uh, not surprising, I don't think. Thank you very much. So Lauren, uh, actually, let me throw, take that question I just read to you, but then let's also throw another little wrinkle into that. Do you have any visibility on private payers? Go. Yeah, so um, obviously, you know, Medicare is kind of our floor for guidelines and, and um, you know, where our private insurances kind of go with their regulations and their guidance. Um, but from a rate setting standpoint, Medicare had, with that 1135 waiver has said that they are going to pay telehealth services at the same rate as, you know, the rates that existed prior to the 1135 waiver. And what that means is there are, and I would encourage you to look through all of the new coding and we have, um, we'll send out links to the CMS website so that you can really be specific as to which codes you're uh, analyzing. But what, what it really comes down to is you're able to use the existing codes out even outside of telehealth. Um, to capture, you know, any um, any engagement that you've had with your patient. So, if you're having a discussion with your patient and it is longer than 10 to 15 minutes, then I would encourage you to look at the 99 series codes that existed. That, and if you feel like you're spending time with those patients, that that you know would have been potentially the same time frame that you would have spent with them within your office, then you know it would be worth looking at the 99 series codes rather than potentially the telehealth codes. It just it comes, and that's where the clinical judgment probably comes in, right? So um, one thing that did exist prior to coronavirus with telehealth, again, is the idea that this patient had to be established. And I wanted to go over that because that's a, that's a big change for you as practicing physicians because the patient had to have been established, it really limited the interactions that you could bill for as, as a telehealth service provider. And what I mean by that is if you had an interaction that was five to 10 to 15 minutes or less, and it was within a week of you seeing that patient in your office, that technically would have been considered follow-up and it would have been bundled into that you know, visit you would have had within the, the walls of the office. The 1135 waiver really took away all of those restrictions. So the way that you should be thinking about your, your practicing with telehealth is what, what is the medical decision making I'm performing? You know, what is the, the value I'm bringing to my patient? And then try to match that up with the code that you're looking to document. And always document, document, document. So. Oh, there's that, there's that. Yeah. Terrific. <laughs> uh, very good. Actually, we are we are fortunate. We had uh, among our audience members is Kevin Plancher, who organizes a wonderful meeting in in uh, an orthopedic summit in Las Vegas every year. He he gave us a wonderful comment. And I'll read it to everybody right now. And if any of the panelists want to comment on it, that'd be great. He says, in terms of the backlog of surgical patients, you should always consider caring for those who can't afford health care. Of course, take care of them. Everyone else. If we now change healthcare completely and make it like New York City and learn who might have finances now, might have skin in the game and make patients pay a portion of their care, I bet that backlog of patients won't be there because many of those operations the pay, patient thinks they need, they will now think twice about. We also know the patient will be more educated just like deciding to buy anything. As Kevin says, that was just an out of the box thought. Uh, Mike, Michael, do you have any reaction to that? And then John, any thoughts? Any, anytime you're taking care of athletes, you're going to be dealing with those type of economic boundaries. So that's a group that wants to go forward because they think that they want to do the things they want to do. 
certainly the first responders are gonna have it done because those are the folks that are going back on the lines. The people in between, uh, when they decide whether they want a tibial osteotomy or a uni or, a uni or something like that to feel better, uh, I think that they're gonna continue because of quality of life. So anytime there's a quality of life issue, I think they're gonna move forward. Yeah. I agree. John, your thought, John Barrington? Yeah, you know, I, in, in terms of using um, decision makers after surgery, I think this is an unknown area for us as well. I will probably stick to my same clinical decision making that I've been using before in terms of uh, the ethics of moving forward. And, and we're going to start with the backlog of patients who were postponed first and move forward with them. And uh, I'll leave it for the guys that are doing uh, more elective, uh, you know, sports or um, arthroscopic type procedures to, to sort of yeah. um, wade into um, the way that they're making decisions to their surgery. But as a primarily hip and knee and shoulder replacement surgeon, I'm going to use the same criteria that I used before surgery, before the epidemic for after we get started again. Yeah, that makes sense. Scott, what's your feeling? How would you, how would you answer that question in terms of your practice? I think the elderly are going to still come in for surgery, to be honest with you. Um, so I think the Medicare population in particular will, will, will stick to their surgery. I think the younger, more active population of people that have been out of work now for a period of time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm primarily a knee and shoulder arthroscopist. And I can tell you, uh, I, the, the, the laborers are not going to come in and have rotator cuff surgery. They're going to postpone. So I think we need to be looking for really solid alternative treatment options for our patients other than surgery. Many of our patients will fall off of that surgical queue in hopes of maintaining uh, their life and their work uh, to be able to provide for their families. Oh, by the way, I have to say, Scott, I love your microphone. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, it, it, some of the panelists may have questions for Laura, Lauren as well. Johnny, uh, do you have any anything you wanna ask Lauren? I do. Actually, um, in re regard to uh, obviously the RPM right now, um, in North Texas, just a comment here, we're seeing that private payers are paying equal to or, or greater than Medicare right now, which is a good thing. My medical director is online and informed me some of this stuff. But uh, also, it is my understanding, two days ago, Medicare made a ruling that is allowing the, the uh, for virtual reimbursement for the 97,000 evaluation codes so that PTs can, can submit these, uh, this billing remotely, which is a big, big deal. Because if you start thinking about this with right now with practice preservation, you know, with the technology that we have available, the remote uh, coding that's there, not only can the providers make a, a fair and reasonable amount of money per month per patient, but they're trying to protect their physical therapists as well. So Lauren, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so I think this kind of gets back to, you know, the fact that with that waiver, you are able to use codes that are already in existing in the code set, and you're encouraged to use those codes as well. I think when we think about from a payment standpoint, yes, obviously, the private insurers are, are likely to pay a percentage higher than Medicare. Um, but also, if you think about how how is CMS and how are private payers potentially going to track um, medical decision making for you as physicians being done at your home or in other areas. Well, the uh, place of service code 02 did go into effect. So if you as physicians want to use codes that already exist that maybe are outside of the telehealth set, as long as you have that place of service 2 um, code on your claim, that's a way for CMS and you and um, private insurers to track kind of where that medical decision making occurred. Mm -hmm. could, could you also maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, principal care management and, and specifically code G2064 and 065? G0264 and 0265. Let me just pull up my code series deck. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I were that good and I knew them all by heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> I'm not that good. We've done a lot of research over the last few no. weeks. <laughs> Micra, Micra is the top firm in the country in all of this stuff. But uh, right. and and I think you all saw, you know, through Lauren's presentation, why why they are, mm -hmm. uh, and absolutely, and, and so. Uh, maybe we can post that up later. One of the nice things about this format is not only recording things, 
but we are also providing a lot of resources in addition to that. So uh, this will be archived. We're going to communicate to everybody and there'll be more stuff coming. And among the takeaways for sure, uh, for VidScript, it's 73771. And the message is COVID-19. Don't forget. And we've got uh, the CDC links that uh, we're going to be providing. Thank you, Lauren, as well as Lauren's slides will be available as well. So before with we all of the codes, uh, oh good, go Lauren. Payment rates, okay. so great. Um, exactly the ones that, that Johnny's referring to. We'll have those available for you. Fabulous. Thank Fabulous. you. Uh, so I think I'm looking here to see what other questions we've got. I think we're in good shape, uh, which is good for me well, as the I'm, moderator. Yes, sir. I'm mention of uh, I, I, that we have certain procedures that we have that require a longer time to recover. Yeah. Well, certainly as an athlete, an ACL, we used to think we could have them back in six months. We now know we need a minimum of nine and yeah. other procedures as well. So we're going to prioritize in sports. I'm sure that Scott's going to do the same based upon the length of time they have till they have to get back on the field or back in play. So that does enter into our decision making. We've sat on some ACLs because it's been thought upon to be in this time of crisis, not the right thing to do. It's yeah. they're gonna, certainly they're going to be on the list of first things done right after the first responders. Well, look, and remember, our patients, you know, they're not coming, the vast, vast majority don't come for us in, with trivial issues. These are, they're really, they really need some assistance. They are on the way to being functionally disabled. So uh, you can't delay this that long. And they really need some strategies today, even though surgery may not be one of the options. That's the whole point of our call today is look at other strategies. Among them is a time release cortical steroid, Zoretta, for example, which is the only one available. And to use all these other ways of staying in touch with our patients and providing information in a variety of ways. That's, that's, that's our new reality. Yeah, well, we uh, certainly today. know that elective doesn't mean unnecessary. Oh my gosh, so, so-called elective. Right, so with that stated, if I have had trouble with, uh, with both my partners who don't do sports, and I've also had trouble with my colleagues in other groups thinking that this is indeed the mindset. And it, it's tough. Uh, we have the equipment. That was one of the things that was fearful. Did we have enough gowns and gloves and things to actually run our surgery centers? Right, and we have right. To but we're keeping a minimal amount available for emergencies and the like. And we're pushing, uh, letting them know that we were wanting to wait maybe two weeks or four weeks and they are continuing to do the rehab, which isn't so bad, but uh, it has to be at home. But we know that we're not gonna be able to wait too long or they're gonna fall into missing another season. Well, you know, and, and you have the benefit of having a radio show, but right. the rest of us who don't have radio shows, there is always vid script, right? Nice. So there are ways. And, and the main takeaway here is there's some innovative solutions. Zilretta, VidScript, Johnny Ross's uh, products, and, and there's more. And there's great guidance coming from AMA, CDC, and uh, always take advantage of the experts like Micra for sure. So uh, on behalf of everybody and all the participants, uh, this has been, this may not have been a two hour meeting, but that's okay. It's quality over quantity, right guys? And I just want to thank everybody. You all were outstanding. This truly was a master faculty today. And with that, uh, I wish everyone stay well, take good care of both yourselves and your patients. And most of all, this will all end the COVID-19. It will end eventually. And we're going to do it with faith, grit, and a lot of teamwork. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin.